all of you to this really exciting presentation. Um, on behalf of Allegiant Global Partners, again, I'm Ann Berger. I am the outreach community outreach director. I am joined by uh, my colleague, Jessica Hessler, who is our director of assistance solutions. Um, and I think with that, Sarah, let's go ahead to the first slide and um, sort of tee things up for what everyone can expect on today's uh, conversation. I mean, as you all know, we are here to focus on COVID-19. We're calling this our town hall uh, informational session. It's an opportunity for us to come together with some of our wonderful partners to talk a little bit further about where we are with this pandemic. Um, some, you know, newsreels around the J&J &J, uh, vaccine and, and what's happening there. Um, we did get some pre-submitted questions, but let me let me just dive right into um, the, the sort of the session overview. Um, first and foremost, I would like to, to recognize our partners who have joined us in this initiative. Um, it, it is it's it's so wonderful to have these kinds of resources for our clients and and for prospects and just in general. Um, and we are joined today by partners from. Aetna International. We have three uh, colleagues joining us this morning or this afternoon, as the case may be. Uh, Dr. Hemel Desai is Aetna, uh, Aetna International's Global Director of Clinical Services. He leads medical affairs for Aetna International um, and is located in London. We also have Sita Hammer, who is the Clinical Director Americas for Aetna International has a strong background. She was a registered nurse, is a registered nurse specializing in clinical care um, and is located in Dallas, Texas. We also have Sarah Dick joining us. And these are all of the folks that you're gonna be hearing from throughout this session. Sarah is the regional manager of sales and service Mid-America for Enter International. She is located in Tucson, Arizona. And then also joining us is um, our Andy Miller, Andrew Miller, who is the Director of America's Partnerships with International SOS. He is located in Baltimore, Maryland, and he leads the relationship with insurance companies um, and also works with carriers and providers to integrate assistance solutions into um, their different programs. So, you know, a fabulous group of, of subject experts to share with us some, some information, facts and figures, updates. Um, they will each, each organization, if you will, will take about 15 minutes to go through a series of, of information sharing. Um, we will then carve out time as a part of our 60 minutes to ensure that we answer questions along the way. I did reference some pre-submitted questions. I will be sure to ask those. I will moderate as we go forward to ensure we're keeping an eye on time. I encourage all of our participants to utilize the chat for any questions you have. And please, as those questions come to your mind, go ahead and type them in. You do not need to wait until the presentations are completed. Go ahead and put those in the chat. I will keep an eye on them and we will be sure that we can answer as many of them as possible. If some are a little bit more specific, um, we may take those offline and follow up with you afterwards, um, but certainly we will do our very best to make sure that all of those questions are answered. We are recording today's session. It will be made available to you um, at, at, at a time shortly after we finish. Um, and again, utilize the chat for any kinds of comments that you have as we go along as well. So with that intro, um, I'm going to pull back now because you clearly don't want to be hearing from me as much as you want to be hearing from our experts. And I'm going to hand things over to Sarah Dick to take us forward and start our presentation. Excellent. Thanks, Anne. And first of all, thank you, of course, to Allegiant, to Anne and Jessica, and then all of you that have taken the time. We know how busy it is. Um, to join us as well as ISOS. I wanted to mention we have an additional guest um, who will be just part of our panel, and that is Kimberly Mendoza. She's our executive director of our SME business in the Americas for Aetna International. And Kim was on the executive team that met every single day to support COVID questions. So we do have her here as an additional resource um, for, for the uh, discussion section. 
feel free to ask questions as we go. And, um, you know, I think I wanted to kick off just briefly with just how, you know, COVID really changed all of us, right? It changed us, uh, the roles that we play in our personal lives as well. Um, and then as a business, it really changed how, what were our priorities, right? And what, what became, you know, top and center is how do we help as an insurance company, how do we help our members access care and even in a different way. So we're really gonna help talk about that and then also help you think through what are some of the resources going forward, you know, as things have changed, what else could you think about um, and, and perhaps explore with your own providers as you, know, as you help your members uh, in, in this COVID event that we've had? which is unprecedented. So I'd like to turn it over first to our medical director, um, Dr. Hemel Desai, to talk about what's going on um, today from a medical perspective and with the vaccines particularly. So Hemel, I'll turn it over to you and let me know, um, you know as we go if you want to advance the slides. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and thank you, Anne, for, for setting up this um, and Allegiant. Um, so today, uh, I guess it's a pleasure for me to be here uh, and, and hopefully I can I can shed some light on, on COVID around the world and to update people on the latest developments on, on the landscape. Uh, things are evolving fairly fast. So even, even this presentation that we put together last week, and um, things have evolved since then. So I'll, I'll, I'll touch on the data that we've got here, but also try and update as we go along, particularly, as we said, uh, around the vaccinations, which is a, a rapidly evolving situation uh, around the world. So hopefully I can shed some light there uh, as well. OK, um, so on, on, on the first, I guess, before when we talk about COVID, it's always uh, important for us to to talk about where we are and 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 what the picture looks like uh, uh, across the world. Um, I'm based in London in the UK and uh, all I hear about on the news here is what's happening in our in our country. I'm fortunate to have a, a more global role so therefore I, I keep tabs on, on what's happening across the world and um, and that I think is uh, it applies to us everywhere. So if you're based in the US generally you'll hear about the US situation and so I think it's important to get a context around what's what's happening across across the world. So if we start with COVID places globally. This is a chart taken from the World Health Organization uh, and this is uh, last week, so the start of last week and things have evolved since then as I've said. But at the start of last week there were 131 million cases uh, with 2.8 million uh, deaths uh, across the world. And if you look at the chart you can quite clearly see that uh, in the early part, so on the left-hand side of the graph, uh, starting March and, and before, uh, there was a slow but steady increase that happened. And, and the first peak of this globally was around June, July uh, and, and, and August where cases peaked and then they plateaued. And then there was a lot, much larger peak that I think many of us felt uh, between uh, October uh, and January. And that was particularly heavy in, in Europe uh, and, and the Americas. As you can see from the case numbers, uh, Europe in green and, and the Americas, uh, which includes North and South Americas, um, in, in, in orange. But, but you, can, you can also quite clearly see that from January, cases start to dip. Uh, and I think uh, particularly if you're in the US or, or Europe, um, you would have felt that across the board. And the first few weeks of January and going into February, cases started to decline quite rapidly. But as we've seen over the last four to six weeks, cases cases are now much more on the increase pretty much in every region uh, across the world. So in, in specific countries, cases may be declining, but as a global picture, uh, cases are beginning to, to increase quite substantially and, and we're almost hitting the heights of, of the second peak around, around, the turn of the, around the turn of the year. So I think, I think there's, a, there's a clear picture now that they we're probably in this third wave, what's described as a third wave across the world. <laughs> Uh, at the moment. Okay, if we can move on to the next slide, sir. So again, th this slide really is trying to show what's happening with vaccines uh, across the world. Um, and there's been incredible uh, progress made on uh, with vaccine development, and there are now over 290 clinical trials evaluating safety and efficacy of vaccines. 
Um, as of last week, there were 29. So I don't know how familiar people are with vaccine trials or clinical trials in general, but essentially you have three phases of a clinical trial, usually before uh, approval is given and approval is, is still is considered as phase four, where there is a wider rollout and continuing monitoring uh, of treatments, uh, which include vaccines as, as well. And, and this, is, uh, this, is, this is how treatments uh, uh, are, are trialed across the world. And so as we look at it now, uh, 29 vaccines in phase one, 41 in phase two, 29 in phase three, uh, and 13 had been improved uh, for use in at least one country uh, as of last week. This number has now increased to 14. So there are 14 vaccines now uh, approved for use in at least one country. And on the right hand side of this, you'll you'll see what which which vaccines are the leading vaccines, and I'm sure you'll you'll have heard of of some of them. But the Oxford AstraZeneca is the one that that has been approved in in for use in 83 countries as of now. It's changing rapidly each day as, as more and more information is coming out, particularly around side effects, which I'll talk about later. But uh, as of last week, it was over 80 countries that the Oxford AstraZeneca had been approved in, as is the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine as well. Um, you'll have heard of probably of Moderna and, and Johnson & Johnson. And again, I'll come back to Johnson & Johnson later, but these have been approved in, in quite a number of countries as well. The one you may or may not have heard of is the Sputnik V, which is a Russian vaccine, which is now approved in almost 60 countries uh, and is gaining approval uh, uh, quite widespread now in many parts of the world as well. Uh, it's a similar technology actually to the Oxford AstraZeneca in, in terms of the technology that sits behind it. Uh, but there are some, uh, some discussion around uh, at what stage of clinical trials this has been approved in, but certainly it's a widespread used uh, vaccine at the moment. And next slide, please. Uh, 733 million vaccine doses as of today was reported uh, to have been delivered uh, by the world, well, that has been reported by the World Health Organization. Um, and this map on the right hand side uh, shows where those vaccines have been administered. So the darker the color, uh, uh, the higher the, 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 the uptake or the share of the proportion of the population that has been given the vaccine. So for example, if I pick out the US on the map, you can see it's a fairly dark color suggesting that it's over 30% of people have been vaccinated, of, of the population who's been vaccinated in the country. Similarly, the same shade has, is, you can see in, in the UK, probably more difficult to see in, in, in Israel, um, but also uh, in Chile, in, in South America. So those are, are, the, are the leading countries in terms of the share of their population being vaccinated with at least one dose. But these are incredible achievements to, to roll out such large numbers of vaccines in a in a single country but the the table on the on the left hand side also shows many many other countries are moving at pace to try and vaccinate their populations usually the vaccination programs uh, as is in the uk and the us uh, focus on those at most need clinically so the most vulnerable groups or the groups that have 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 suffered the most uh, because of covid infection and and this tends to be uh, uh, common across the board. So uh, governments at the moment are prioritizing the groups, particularly older and more vulnerable populations uh, to, to get vaccinated first. But there are different regimes uh, across, across the world. Uh, so it's worth checking on if, if you have um, uh, populations in, in particular countries around what the specific vaccination rollout plans are uh, for those. Um, until yesterday, uh, there were three vaccines that were approved for use in the US, uh, Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J, &J, uh, or Johnson & Johnson Janssen vaccine. Uh, I'm sure you're aware that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has been temporarily paused uh, in the US uh, while there's an investigation into, into six cases of uh, a condition called CVST. Um, or cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. 
Uh, and this is a very rare condition and it essentially means a clot in a part of the of, of the brain that has been picked up. Uh, it's also associated with uh, uh, bleeding or concurrent bleeding that happens and the, and the, the science behind this has now been uh, teased out as well very very quickly around why these things happen. Um, sadly uh, one of the six cases uh, has um, uh, one of the six people affected has, has died and one is in critical condition uh, as of this this morning, uh, Europe time. Um, the cases occurred in, in women aged 18 to 48 years old and um, the symptoms occurred between 6 and 13 days post-vaccination with a median of about nine days. So that's the, that's the picture that has evolved from, uh, from the US data around Johnson & Johnson. Uh, the pause in the US is expected to last at least a few days before further data uh, is looked at and evaluated and, and a decision is made around what to what to do with the Johnson & Johnson specifically uh, in terms of rollout. Uh, to date, about seven, just under seven million doses of Johnson & Johnson vaccine has been given. So, so you can see from a population perspective, um, perspective, this is a very rare condition and a rare side effect. And you would only really pick up these types of numbers if you have a very large vaccination program, uh, because these are very rare side effects. But links are now, uh, have, have been made and it's thought uh, fairly con conclusively in the scientific literature that it, 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 it probably is related to the vaccine. And I'll come back to some of the science around that. Um, a similar vaccine which uses a uh, similar technology is the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, and that's widespread use uh, around the world. Uh, in the UK there, there's been uh, over 20 million doses given uh, of this vaccine and uh, there's been 79 reports of blood clotting, similar uh, condition um, that has been described to the, to the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine and again the spread is uh, skewed towards younger groups, uh, but there have been cases in, in, in older people as well. And sadly, 19 people have died out of the 79 cases. So again, very rare in terms of big numbers, but obviously can affect people who are otherwise um, healthy, uh, as seems to be the case as well. So regulators are looking at what to, to do and, and around policy around some of the vaccine rollouts. Um, I guess, what is the reason behind this? Um, I'll try and explain this in the, in the easiest, simplest way uh, possible. But as with all medications, vaccinations uh, and other forms of treatment, there's always a risk benefit. And if you look at your packets of, of over-the-counter medications, they usually have very long lists of side effects, some of them rare, some of them more common. And so uh, vaccines are no different. And, and you know, these vaccines are no different. And as you can see, the monitoring process is picking up you know, some of these very rare but significant side effects. And so I think it's important to, to put that into context. And you can only do that, obviously, if, if the numbers are large. This particular complication seems to be confined to those vaccines that are using a, a, a vector to, to Im implant either DNA or RNA into the cells. And that, and that vector is, a, is another virus called adenovirus, which is usually fairly benign. And, um, and that vector helps the, the, the protein uh, that, that you may have heard of the spike protein of the coronavirus to be implanted so that, that, that we can generate an antibody response to it. With adenovirus, there is a known complication that can happen and then very rarely, which is you can get an antibody or some people can get an antibody response to that adenovirus. And, uh, and that's more common in people who have a specific type of uh, antibody uh, to something called platelet factor four. And so th that's why um, this seems to be happening with these two particular vaccines that use adenovirus to, to, to implant. Uh, there is another vaccine that also does that uh, as well. Um, and so, uh, and the Sputnik vaccine actually also uses that as well. So I think there's probably a little bit more data to come on that. And, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll hear more about um, vaccine policy in the future uh, and regulators will certainly take a view on whether these are safe particularly in some age groups as you get younger where the risk benefit of taking a vaccination is, is, is slightly different to older, older groups. 
So I'd keep a watching brief on that. Uh, finally, I just wanted to touch, next slide, Sarah, and I'll be quick. Um, I just wanted to touch on uh, vaccination rollouts uh, in the US, uh, CVS, our parent company, uh, as with other pharmacies, uh, such as Walgreens, uh, are supporting the vaccine rollout um, and are providing significant capacity within the system. I think CVS capacity is a sort of staggering 25 million shots per month. Um, and people can book, book their vaccination through the digital app uh, quite easily and, 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 and simply across, across the country. But this is something that's happened in the US. It's very variable around the world in terms of how you can access vaccines and how, how they're delivered. And so if you have people in other countries, it's really best to, to check either with your insurer, who I'd hope be able to, to guide you around where, where, where you can get your vaccinations, but also with the State Department uh, or Foreign Office websites, um, depending upon where you're, uh, where you're based, uh, who should also be able to explain what's happening in a particular country. That's all from me. Uh, hopefully people have found that useful. Um, Sarah, I'll pass it back to, to you, because I think you're going to talk about some additional support yeah. that insurers can provide. Absolutely. Um, and I'll pause for a second. I don't know if any of any questions had come in on the chat. Hi, Sarah, it's Anne. We do not have any questions submitted thus far. Uh, so I think we can keep going with okay. the um, information and we'll pause again, perhaps before we hand things over to Andy, just to cover that. And then I think we can ask questions um, as they come in toward the end. Perfect, thank you. So yeah, it's a perfect transition here um, because really what is the, you know, how, how is, are the insurers, you know, able to help members? And in many ways, this one of the silver linings for COVID-19 was people began to utilize services that they sort of knew were out there. They got a flyer in the mail or on their email and didn't really do anything about it. And then because of that need, to access healthcare and they didn't know how, they were in lockdown, how do I get to a doctor? Suddenly there, there really was a, a wonderful sort of silver lining in that people started to learn how to utilize some of these services that have been available, but really not utilized to the same degree. And you know, even just quickly, even with the vaccines being administered through pharmace pharmacies, um, you know, the digital technology is, is very high and very good it makes it so easy to get a vaccine because you get texts, you get you know really easy way to sign up. So there's there are some exciting um, silver linings here, and we thought it, you know I'll be talking through what is the insurer's role. You know what are some of the services you can check on with your insurer um, to see if they offer these. I would say the majority do. But just quickly wanting to start with a few stats to set the stage of what did we see in COVID nineteen over the past year. Um, and, and, you know, one, in no particular really order, but we saw, you know, mental health was top of mind for people. Um, there is a, in our appendix that we'll provide, there's a study that Aten International did, which really highlighted that employees particularly felt a greater need for mental health services and sometimes more than their employers even perceived. I think it's 42% of employees wanted more mental health services um, and really thought that they, they, they even thought their employers could improve in that even more than the employers realized. So there's some really interesting stats, but you can see we had a 262% increase in mental health related calls. Um, we have an app called WISA, which is, a, you know, it's your 4am friend. It's like a, a it's, it, it's an app where you can you know, access when you're not feeling well, you want to chat with someone, it's virtual. 77% increase in the usage of that. We had, um, you know, more WISA users. Our EAP, which again, just about every insurance company offers this, but 100% increase in EAP utilization. Suddenly everyone was like, wow, what is an EAP for? Um, and now I know. And then here is really the big one, four times the global utilization of telemedicine. Um, and you can see here, this is a USA stat. This one's a global stat four times, but telemedicine just in the US via CVS went up 750%. So 
clearly people, they didn't know how to get to the doctor, particularly during lockdown. And suddenly they were accessing online ways and on their phones, way to, ways to speak with doctors. And we found that the majority of the calls were actually calls for regular me medical care, not mental health necessarily, but actual you know, visits to specialists, the dermatologist, primary care. So suddenly this became very important and typically it was through your, you know, your health insurer often provides these resources um, within the healthcare plan. So that's important. And then another one is the increase in pharmaceutical access through the health insurance company. Um, you know, Aetna provides mail order drug in the US. We also provide mail order drug outside the US. So people who are, you know, located globally can in most countries get mail order prescription as well. And then CVS here in the US was providing, uh, they had a 500% increase in people that wanted that home delivery. So again, those are important areas. And then if we get into just the number of tests, and I'll talk a lot more about that on the next slide, but the tests that were administered, CVS administered 10 million tests. So you can see just um, that's been incredibly important. And then just members that were reached because they were at risk. Most insurance companies have really robust clinical teams, see to hammer, you know, heads up hours on an international. And so, you know, 650,000 members who are at risk, those are people that were identified as potentially having um, risk for COVID, as well as those that have COVID. Um, CETA's team would make outreach calls to anyone that had COVID as well as those that were identified. So they'd make those proactive calls, text messaging, reach outs. So these are all incredible services that really are available already baked into your healthcare plans. Okay, so then I'll stop here. And really before I go through this slide particularly, I wanted to just highlight a lot of the different services specifically, but essentially, you know, the health insurance companies became the primary way that people would also access healthcare, and especially globally, where they might not know how to get that care, and suddenly they urgently need it because of COVID. Um, they're locked down. They're just not sure what to do. So the way we've divided this up is, you know, employees or members, they tend to be in three categories. And you may or may not realize this, but many will be healthy and thriving, but they still want to access some of these different care because they're trying to have preventive care. They're trying to make sure they don't receive have COVID. They also, many of them are surviving but struggling and that's that whole pandemic fatigue. So, um, or they have a health condition and it's not going well. So they met, many will fall into this category and not admit it either. And then you have others that are in crisis and unwell and that speaks to Again, people don't always want to admit this, but they're really struggling. They have kids at home. They're doing all these Zoom calls. They're really worried. And so members tend to fall into these three categories. And so most insurers have designed ways to really support all three categories. Um, and so you will want to make sure you're taking advantage of this. So there's a lot of health self-help resources. And then on the professional side, a lot of professional resources I'll quickly go through them, and then what I'm going to do is talk through how we have supported COVID specifically. But overall, on a professional side, there's a lot of therapeutic counseling available. EAP programs are almost always baked in and have, you know, rich benefits, at least six free sessions typically for each condition. So that means you can call in for COVID. You could call in because you're stressed financially for a whole nother set of sessions. You could call in, you know, because your husband's concerned, he may have lost his job, going on, right? So you get, uh, you get to have more sessions based on, on whatever reason you're calling in. We also have a lot of, I, a lot of services to, to help with stress, and they can be both the self-help, but also provided through the clinical care team. Um, you know, at Aetna specifically, CETA's team has a behavioral health specialist, a nurse that, you know, her clinical training is in behavioral health on the team. And we also have you new know, nurses, again, that reach out specifically to members by text or by phone call. 
Um, there's a lot of coaching. Nurses are typically trained to also do coaching sessions. Um, and then we have through telemedicine, Be Health, we call it often globally in the US, it's referred to as telemedicine. Um, Aetna provides teledoc for free and then Be Health outside the US. And again, this is quite common with other carriers as well. So a wonderful way to access, and you saw that was incredibly important. And then on the self-help side, there are a lot of apps available through insurance companies provided for free. Um, WISA is one of them that Aetna provides, but we also have sleep apps. We have apps for musculoskeletal support, you know, therapies, just fun games, you know, <laughs> things you can do, which you don't have to buy separately because you can access them. So sleep help, you know, that, that's been incredibly important. So all of these are some of the items provided, but I did want to pause and go through specific to COVID questions that you might have had about what is actually covered. So I'll first talk through on, um, on the medical plan. So if you have an expatriate plan, and then separately, I'll talk about business travel plans because they are slightly different in what they cover. But typically on the medical plan, coverage for expats, inpats, third country nationals who have you know, a formal expatriate program, they will have, you know, we, we, we provided extended coverage. So beginning with COVID, there were a lot of liberalizations. And so hospitalizations were covered um, all the way waivers on, um, you know, co-pays, for example, hospitalizations were covered at 100%. And then the V-Health coverage or the telemedicine coverage, typically the co-payments were waived and people could access those services for free for, for a particular time period. Um, testing was covered for, for no charge. And then the vaccinations are covered at no charge. So all of that was covered for a particular period of time. Many of the carriers, that time period is over for the actual free charge um, cost waivers, um, but coverage still continues for the actual COVID care. So examples would be, there will be full coverage for COVID if someone you know, has COVID. There will also be coverage for quarantines in a hospital. If you're you know, required to stay in that hospital because of a quarantine, that will be covered by the insurance company as well on your plan typically. And then obviously evacuations for COVID related needs, those are covered. Um, testing for COVID is covered, and that's typically um, covered for diagnostic purposes, and that's both inside and outside the U.S. So any type of testing that's needed is going to be covered. And then immunizations are covered. Outside the U.S., there may or may not be administration charge. So the only caveat I'll say there is the tests are 100% covered inside and outside the U.S., the difference would just be outside the U.S., the member might have to pay up front for an admin charge. If that wasn't covered by a government program, then the member might be charged for that admin fee, but the insurance company outside the U.S., we will typically cover that admin fee. Um, inside the U.S., they usually aren't even charged for that fee up front, so making it very easy. And then on... Um, I mentioned the telemedicine coverage, the mail order drug coverage is there. Uh, mental health coverage is obviously provided. I will give you, give you some coverage it's insights onto the, the travel plans. It's very interesting on travel plans, the testing is covered as well as the care. So if someone develops COVID and they're on just, a, they're on, I don't wanna say just, but they're on a business travel plan, um, rather than an expatriate plan, then the testing is covered as well as the health care is covered if you have COVID. What's critical to know on a business travel plan is typically the vaccinations are not covered because the expectation is those will be covered um, on the individual's home country plan. So just a caveat there, and we can answer questions if you have those later. Um, another typical question that we're getting um, would just be, is there a way for Aetna or for the insurance company to help someone get testing or get a vaccination um, kind of ahead of time, right? 
what that is important to distinguish. So testing, we can definitely help folks get access to that. But the actual vaccination, we do not have an ability to make, make people go to the front of the line, so to speak. So because vaccinations are really controlled in, by the supply, by each individual government and even each individual state, the insurance company is not able to help the individual get that faster. But what we are able to do is help with giving them the resources, helping them know where to get that information. And, you know, most typically the World Health Organization website is one of the best resources um, as well as the State Department. The State Department has excellent resources. You know, I went into the United States Health Department website, a lot of good questions there. One of the questions that we've had is, you know, is the U.S. Embassy able to help expedite or is U.S. Embassy going to be able to offer um, vaccinations? And the answer to that is the U.S. Health Department is not. They will, though, help really help provide the individual, again, with access access to finding where they can get those vaccinations. Um, there's a program called SNAP, where you can go into the State Department website, get signed up, and you'll, you will get those releases of information from that local State Department resource. So some really good resources. And finally, I would say, and Hemel and Sita can really help give you some more live examples, but our nurses will really, especially if someone's very, very concerned and worried, um, the nurses will provide that individualized coaching on what, what they can do. So overall, you know, that is essentially, we're, we're, our role has definitely been robust and probably become more robust as an insurance company and how we can help members get access to care. Um, we've provided great information on our own websites and again, our own portals for members and every insurance company would be doing that. So, I, you know, I wanted to pause. That was a whole lot of information. I'll scroll through briefly what, what we've included in, in our appendix. We've got some other really good slides, but I did want to pause for a minute just to see if there would be any questions that myself, that Hemel, um, Dr. Desai uh, Hemel, or even Sita Hammer would be able to help you with. So let me just pause there. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. That was really terrific. Um, there, there is so much information on, on this topic. I feel like, you know, we, we're, we're, we're flying through an hour in all of this. Um, and I will say I, I have not, uh, any questions I did receive in the chat, I was able to handle directly. Um, again, we did have a couple submitted. I think, Sarah, you just took care of one of those questions. But in the, in the you know, in the essence of time, I think if it's okay with you, Sarah, Sita, and Hemel, I'd like to um, turn the floor over to, to Andy yeah. Miller to, 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 okay. yeah, to basically be able to do that piece because I there was a pre-submitted question that has to do with, with emergency assistance and um, you know travel and evacuation and so forth. So it, if, if that would be okay, I think we'll Absolutely. go to that. And then, um, but again, thank you both. That was just fabulous. So I'll, I'll pull back and let you move it forward. Perfect. And ju these are just a couple of slides with some studies and just information again that we, you know, were able to share. So now, Andy, let me turn it over to you. Give me one second here. All right. And I'm making you the host. So let me know when you've got that. They're not quite yet, but okay. while I'm waiting for that, Again, some fantastic information from the Edna team. Thanks for sharing that. And just a, a quick reintroduction here as well. So my name is Andy Miller. I'm the head of partnerships for International SOS. And wanted to go through a couple different points with the group here. So understanding that there are really two major components between uh, building out these duty of care programs or travel risk management programs, the insurance piece of it, and then kind of everything else around. And how has that changed as we're coming out of a, the COVID-19 pandemic and really resuming travel? And I don't, doesn't look like I have control. So Sarah, if you can just kick over to the next one. We'll just yeah, the that's fashioned way. completely fine. There you go. Yeah, so how has really, the first thing here is how has the global pandemic redefined duty of care? So I think everyone on this call is familiar with duty of care. It's been a topic that is every conference you've gone to over the past five to 10 years, there's always panels on duty of care. And what does that mean? 
for your for expatriate travelers or for your business travelers. I think the number one thing that we're seeing coming out of this is for companies that had their head in the sand that said, hey, I know DD Care is out there. I don't really know what to do, so I'm not going to do anything. That has changed. Every organization these days needs to have something in place to respond as they resume travel or as they resume putting people out into the field or really honestly as they bring people back into their domestic offices and resume their domestic workforce. So what does that look like? And again, it's not just having a vendor like International SOS or one of our other uh, other providers that might be out there. It's a lot of this is just internal. How do you build it out? How do you build out your response protocols? How do you know if you have someone that's impacted? So for example, if you have people going to go back out on the road, it turns out you saw the news, there was an outbreak in a hotel in London. How do you know if you had someone there? If you had someone within there in London in the past 14 days, how do you track that travel? How do you make sure you communicate with those? So having all of those procedures and the policy and the tools in place before you start sending people out of the road is going to be critical. The other thing I want to point out as well, and Sarah addressed this in, in part of her talk there, people are nervous, right? It's they're there are even people who are comfortable on business travel a year ago. You know, I myself, I used to travel 200,000 miles a year. I haven't been on a plane in over a year. So that first time I go on a plane, I'm going to be a little bit nervous, right? I think people are not used to being out there as much as they were in the past. So how do you prepare for that? How do you communicate with them? How do you provide the tools to them to make sure that when you are asking them to go on that first business trip, that they're prepared, they're feeling comfortable for it, and they're prepared to know what to do if something would happen. So again, if you haven't put a duty of care program in place, Talk to your partners at Allegiant, talk to us, talk to Edna, talk to whoever you're working with to make sure that you do have something in place before you send people back out on the road. So again, Sarah, if you can kick over the next one here. Again, the, if, as we continue this, so what is what should you be thinking about now? How you're keeping your travelers or really your entire population safe? As you see in the news and as Dr. Desai talked about, the vaccines are getting out there, but there's still a lot of work to do. And I think the number one piece of this is if you haven't already, internally get with the other stakeholders in your company if you're within travel or benefits get with legal get with risk get with hr make sure that all of the different pieces of your organization are aligned that's what does return to travel look like what is critical for you and that's going to be different for every organization that's out there right it what's critical for international sos for a business trip or what's critical for Aetna for business trip or what's critical for all of you out there is going to be a little bit different depending on your culture of your organization on what you do uh, on what your mission is right so as you define out what is critical you need to kind of build out what will you require to that person to meet the uh, requirements to get them back out on the road. Will you require them, for example, to have a vaccine? Will you require them to have pre-travel testing? If they're going into a location that requires pre-travel testing, is there a budget for that if it's not covered by your insurance program? I know Sarah had mentioned that uh, diagnostic COVID tests are covered usually, and this is probably a question we can get to at the end here, Sarah, but if a, a destination requires you to have a a pre-travel COVID test before you go or before you return. If that's not covered by an insurance program, how are you budgeting for that? So right now, what you should be doing when people are not yet out on the road is really preparing for that minute when someone comes to you and says, look, we need to get back out there to resume our mission. This trip is going to be critical for us moving forward. And how can you respond to them and say, yes, we know what we're going to do. So again, if you flip over to the next one as well, Sarah, as we go through this and we're thinking, what do we International SOS or your, your traditional duty of care programs, what are we recommending to our clients as they do begin to build out this resumption of travel plan? I think, as I said, number one across the board, the number one thing we recommend to clients is define what is critical for your organization and then build out steps to make sure that when someone comes to you, that you know how to implement that plan. So again, and part of this is working with your vendors. Part of it is making sure that your travel risk management program talks to your insurance carriers. Part of it though, a lot is internally, what are your escalation protocols? What's your response protocol? If you get that call in the middle of the night from your assistance company saying, we have a COVID positive person that's an employee of yours in the hospital, in Nairobi, what are you going to do? What's required from the organization's perspective to respond to that? So 
what we're seeing now, again, while people aren't traveling, while people aren't necessarily back in the office yet, now's the time to really show the value of your role as well and saying to your executive teams, look, we are ready. We have this resumption of travel plan in place. And it's something that you can rely on your partners, rely on. Come to, to Ann and Jess at Allegiant. If you're a client of ours, come to International SOS. If you're not, we'd love to talk to you as well. But there are a lot of different vendors out there and partners that can help you do this if you don't have uh, something in place already on your own. And then just the last thing I wanted to talk about from the assistance side, so if you kick over to that last one, we get lots of questions around evacuations. So International SOS has done over a thousand COVID positive evacuations since this started, and it is incredibly complex. So I think most of you on the line, just in the in the NGO space, or the IGO space, or the student space, evacuations happen, right? It's something that we're all familiar with. They they are fairly frequent, but I want to remind you. In, across all of our business, so International SOS handles four plus million cases or calls a year, less than 3% of what we actually do are evacuations. So it is a very small piece of it. So again, when you're thinking about what should we be worried about, you need to also be worried about that 85%, which are just calls and advice and for support for mental health. But talking in this for this group here, we know evacuations happen. They happen at a higher rate, typically for the NGO or the student community. So what should you be doing now to prepare for that potential wave of an evacuation? Again, I think number one, make sure you have a trusted provider in place. So whatever that provider is, make sure that you're comfortable with the capabilities to do an evacuation in the age of COVID. And it's as both our partners at Aetna can attest and our medical team at International SOS, it is complicated. It's it's a lot more complicated than it was a year ago to move someone that potentially is COVID positive or even to move someone who's not COVID related. You have a, a heart attack. It's more complicated to get overflight permits. It's more complicated to get someone in and out of facilities. So again, have a provider that you trust and ask the tough questions to your provider of what their experience is and how they would handle evacuations in given locations. And then just the last two things I wanna to touch on here. A lot of this again is make sure that you're having these conversations internally. Make sure that you know where your people are. Make sure that you know the risk they face and what you're going to do to prepare them when they get out on the road. If something does happen, that they are prepared to respond. They know who to call. And then again, I think we're probably all familiar with the, the six Ps, right? Proper preparation. I won't go into the rest of it, but proper preparation here is incredibly important. I and mean, just as we're, we're all starting to see travel pick up, we're all starting to see our colleagues and our employees coming and saying, look, I need to go on this trip because of X reason. We want to be able to say yes, but we need to be prepared that when they come to us, we know to say yes and here are the things you need to do to be safe on that trip. And we know internally what our protocols are, that if we do require an evacuation, we know what our escalation keys are. We have everything linked up between our assistance provider and our insurance carrier, and all that works well and is tested, it's planned for, it's adjusted before you actually have one of your people calling you from the hospital at two in the morning, you need to know what to do now. So again, all of this can be uh, can be done in advance. A lot of it is the preparation. And again, rely on Allegiant, rely on us, rely on Aetna. I think we have, we did want to leave some time here for some questions from the group. I see a couple in the chat. So Anne, we'll kick it back over to you for the last five minutes or so here to get into the questions. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andy. Thank you, Sarah, uh, Dr. Desai. That was that was fabulous. Um, so a couple of questions that have come in in the chat that I want to address directly. There have been questions, as you probably have all seen, relative to access to this information. Um, absolutely, we are recording the session. Um, I have the deck that both Sarah, um, Dr. Desai, and Andy have have gone over with all of us and I am happy to provide that to each of you. I can email those to you directly. So absolutely on that one. Uh, Mo, you had asked about a link to the State Department website for US citizens living internationally to access vaccine information. Um, again, if we get short on time, I'm happy to make sure I get that information from Sarah Mo and we'll gladly email that to you as well. Um, we had a couple of questions. I think that covers the questions regarding those two pieces. We also had a question submitted, and, and, and again, this may have been answered, but I always feel it's great to just review it. Is it necessary for employers to bring 
expats back to the U.S. to get vaccinated, or is there a way for expats to access U.S. vaccines at U.S. embassies in their host countries? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And, and the reality is the U.S. embassy is not getting involved in that. So there, there are some, some suggestions on the State Department website, but I think the consideration there as an employer would be do you bring people back home? Um, it, what what the insurance companies can typ typically provide you also is schedulers for the US. So if your employees want to check that out ahead of time, make sure they can sign up here in the US, maybe at one of the pharmacies, get, get a firm appointment. You know, it might be worth bringing them home. You, the other consideration though is that they would might have to go back into quarantine. Um, so those are considerations to make for sure. And we'll, we'll send the links out. That's great, Sarah. That's great. Are there, I have one other question, but I, I don't want to, I know we're coming right down to the wire here in our last five minutes. Um, so I'll just do a last call for any questions through the chat um, that might come in. Um, and let me also say, if there are questions, I know several of you have talked about wanting to share this information with your broader teams and your colleagues. Um, and if there are questions that result um, as a result of you sharing this, please don't hesitate to be in touch with me. I am happy to take those questions and, and to work with our partners to be sure that you have that information. So, you know, the, this, the, this learning does not end here, as we all know. So, so please, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me in that way. Um, but I'll ask this, this final question. Um, how does travel to high risk COVID areas potentially affect or impact medical coverage and emergency assistance? So Sarah, I can adjust from the assistance side. There is no impact in the assistance side. So we were able to provide assistance as we were pre-COVID. There's no necessarily change in the service level or our ratings essentially for uh, post-COVID world, but I'll defer to you, Sarah, on the medical side. Yeah, and we, we view it the same way. So, you know, said essentially you have the full coverage um, of the healthcare plan, you know, regardless of where you are in the, in the world. Uh, so, you know, it would be the same answer as Andy's to this. Terrific, terrific. I don't have any other questions. Um, I know we have just a few more minutes. You know, from our, our partner's perspective or, um, you know, Jess Hessler, from your perspective, are there other kinds of frequently asked questions that perhaps we can cover quickly? Um, or, you know, in all honesty, if we have really hit on the major areas, that's great. I just didn't want to, you know, with having you all here, it's just it's such a wonderful group of experts to be sure that we, we really have sort of provided those most frequently asked or concerns. Thanks, Anne. This is Jessica Hessler. And I just want to um, mention that there is one question in the chat. I'm not sure if we got to this or not. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and read it out loud. Um, could you share the U.S. State Department website for U.S. citizens living internationally to access vaccine information? Yes, well, thank you, Jess. I, we did get that, and I had responded to, to the, the participant, and um, Sarah will be sharing her site so we can be sure that we're linking folks with the same information that she pulls from. Perfect. Thank yep. you, Anne. Oh, absolutely, Jess. No, that's great. You had one question for me, actually, to the Edna team. So, Sarah, as you're talking about the policy typically covering COVID testing, so would a typical insurance policy cover a test pre-travel if it was required by the destination? Yeah, so we are covering diagnostic testing, so we wouldn't cover the, you know, testing right where just to get into the U.S., um, we do have CETA on the line, so I don't know, CETA, if you want to elaborate at all, but, you know, Hopefully that's a summary. Yeah, and this is a great point for those on the line as well. If that's not a budgeted yeah. line item for you now, if you have to pay now for a pre-travel COVID test before you leave in your trip, when you're on a connecting flight, let's say you're going from your one location a week later to another location and back in, make sure that you have a budget line item for whatever you might have to pay for those people right. to actually be back on the road. 
Yeah, I think I think that's a great point, uh, Andy. I think I think the, the the main thing is to is to check with a, a different insurers. Do have different policies, but generally, uh, I think most insurers are covering what's needed from a healthcare perspective. So if you're ill or you're suspected to be ill, and if your doctor feels that, that you need a test, I think that's usually covered under most policies where it becomes a discretionary uh, test uh, that, that may not be because you're ill, but because you may have chosen to do an activity um, that generally tends not to be covered. But I think it's an important point to, to make sure that that is checked under your uh, benefits and coverage. Terrific. Well, again, uh, on behalf of Allegiant and Aetna uh, and International SOS, we are so pleased to have been able to host this session and so thrilled with the number of participants and, and folks that joined us. Um, I hope you all found it as uh, valuable and informational. Um, again, I will do follow up with any questions um, relative to information sharing. I will get the recording and slides out. Um, and again, please feel free to reach out to me as you share this more broadly with your colleagues and teams with any questions that come up. Um, so again, on behalf of all of us, thank you. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, evening, um, and look for more of these sessions and partnerships uh, with Allegiant Hosting to come. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you in the future.